right, then let's get going and talk about some wild parrots. Um, this presentation was uh, written in October for an event that we did for uh, the California Academy of Sciences. They run an event called Nightlife, which is um, a weekly event in the evenings. And we went along with some wild parrots and some other parrots for fun. And they asked us to give a presentation about the wild parrots. So that was um, that was why we kicked off with a little bit about Mikabu. So I'm gonna just lightly, um, given that this is recorded and we'll put a version of this up online for posterity. I'll talk a little bit about Mikabu, but then we'll get into talking about the wild parrots. So let's start there. And feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go. I'm very happy to take them either as, as they come in and we'll have some time at the end as well. Or if you want to ask about how to donate, that's also a great question. And um, Pam will field those happily whilst we're going through this too. So here's just a little bit about Mikabu for people who are newer to the organization. It was founded 25 years ago. This is our 25th year, which is pretty fun and a great achievement, nice milestone. Um, it was named after two birds called Mick and Abu. If you weren't part of our event yesterday, we had a little trivia quiz about that. This is a photograph of Mick. I don't have a picture of Abu, but um, Mick was a cockatiel and so was Abu. So they were two cockatiels and uh, Tammy imaginatively stuck their names together. And that was how we came up with the name Mick Abu, which has stuck for the, for the, the whole duration. You can find out a lot more about us on our website. I'm not gonna go on at length here. Um, and if you hang out with us in the social hour at three o'clock after the auction, you can chat with us about a whole lot of other stuff and we'll talk some more there. Um, but I did want to show that uh, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, we do have a lot of fun. So here's some examples of us out and about being Mikabooers or Mikabooligans as we like to call ourselves. Um, we do outreach events and we go to adoption fairs. And we have toy making parties. Uh, here's a bunch of happy and very creative toy makers holding all of their uh, creations and designs. And uh, some of you may even have, be bidding on these very items in the auction right now. I hope you are. Um, and we're also proud members of the Parrot Conservation Alliance, which is a uh, organization that was founded uh, approximately three years ago. Um, there have been a number of these uh, coalitions over the years. This is the latest one, um, which is active at the moment. And this is connecting all of the major rescues and sanctuaries for parrots across the US and a little bit beyond. We have a couple of members in Belize and Guatemala and also in Canada. So there are people in this photograph from Project Perry, the big uh, sanctuary in Virginia, from the um, exotic avian sanctuary of Tennessee, uh, Kinhana there. Um, Janet Trumbull from the Oasis, which I'm sure most of you will have heard of, uh, is in this picture next to Michelle. Um, the tall grass sanctuary. Um, my goodness, uh, there's, uh, oh, the Northeast uh, Avian Rescue Group um, on the East Coast, Bob and Jill are there. Um, it's a pretty amazing collection of parrot advocates and welfare advocates. Um, who all believe that parrots shouldn't live in cages. So um, it was very, um, it was an honor to be invited to be part of this alliance uh, the year that it was founded. Um, uh, the, the bar for entry is pretty high. Um, the sanctuaries that in, were invited were all GFAS accredited and they were able to nominate rescues and at least two of them had to nominate a rescue for them to be invited. And that was how we were invited to be part of this. So that's a pretty high bar to meet. Uh, and a lot of work. So some amazing people in here. And also Carol Baskin is in this photograph. You can spot her, uh, see if you can find her. She was there as well, giving us lots of advice on fundraising. This was before Tiger King came out. So uh, we know Carol very well. Uh, and this is just another picture of us uh, visiting the East Sanctuary in Tennessee. Um, but before you think it's all smells and fun and games, uh, Parrot Rescue is hard work. Um, this is a basement which we rescued a bunch of Neophema grass parakeets out of. Um, and it's dirty, hard, filthy work. Um, and we do it all the time. So um, just in contrast to the smiles and the fun times, uh, this is Knut removing a couple of Neophema from that basement. Uh, this was after a gentleman passed away in Hayward and uh, he'd been breeding these birds in, their base, in his basement with artificial lighting. Um, there were about 40 birds in there and we rescued uh, about two thirds of them. 
Um, so yeah, we're um, it's not all glamorous work. Uh, it involves a lot of cage scrubbing and cage washing. Um, and uh, it involves filthy, filthy aviaries and um, groveling around in inches of dirt uh, and catching birds in pretty uh, unhealthy conditions. So um, I think it's it's good to show the good times, but also important for us to recognize the amazing work that our volunteers are doing, pulling birds out, out of pretty awful situations like this. So I think that's uh, good to show, even though it's not always fun. That's what we do. So let's talk about our friends, the wild parrots. These are my friends in San Francisco. Uh, I thought it might be a good place to start maybe just to show you where the birds are located because I'm sure many of you are aware that we have wild parrots living in the Bay Area around here. But let's start with a highly scientific map that I have spent hours researching and preparing for you. This is my map. This is uh, the three locations where we know there are to be um, sizable and active flocks of conures. So uh, you, many of you will have heard of the wild parrots of Telegraph Hill, otherwise known as the wild parrots of San Francisco these days, because they visit Telegraph Hill, but they don't really live there anymore. So uh, I'm sort of, we recognize the Telegraph Hill heritage, but they're all over the city. Uh, and then in Palo Alto, there's a lesser known, uh, smaller flock of wild parrots. Um, and we have rescued a bird from that flock. And uh, we, we haven't had a lot of activity with them, but we have helped one bird who uh, looks like he had to run in with a building or a car. Uh, and then there's a, a larger um, flock down in Sunnyvale. They roost in Las Palmas Park. And uh, we've had contact with a couple of the um, employees who do maintenance in that park and see the birds regularly um, and we've rescued probably something in the region of about five or six birds from that flock generally speaking they um there's a lot of space down there they don't have a lot of issues um we really haven't seen a lot of um rescue scenarios with them we've had a couple that were found injured with broken wings in backyards and we had one that was shot unfortunately um, and didn't make it um, but in all of the years that we've been active, we've taken in very few birds from that flock. So they, they tend not to need our help so much. Uh, in San Francisco, however, you know, it's just a, it's a more challenging place to live for the birds. There's a lot more tall buildings, there's a lot more vehicles, um, and there's also rat poison. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, um, but it is the largest flock. Um, uh, and uh, there are currently about 220 birds in the flock in San Francisco. Uh, this is a picture of all of them and when you say 220 birds you kind of picture a pretty sizable number of birds but the reality is that when they roost in the park by the embarcadero at night um, they really just take up a couple of trees uh, 220 birds is uh, it's not that much um, and if you're there in the winter months as it is now um, you'll be able to see them pretty easily because the trees are bare. And so that's a good time to go and get a count. And in fact, we'll aim to do that in the next month or two um, before the foliage grows back and it's a lot harder to do pictures like this. Uh, how do we know that there are about 220 birds? Well, we have a very scientific way of counting them. We do this, uh, take a picture, and then kind of group them roughly in groups of 10, which is what these dots show. Um, and if you count up all of those, you end up with something around 220. Now there's probably a handful of stragglers that weren't in the picture at the time, but this was before they took off from their morning roost. So they all roost together. And then the moment the sun comes up and there's any light, they start sort of cawing and moving around a little bit. And then they start doing warm up laps, um, which is very fun to watch. If you want to go and see them, I recommend to go and see them in the morning at sunrise. It's worth getting out of bed for, um, cause you can watch them do their warm up laps. And they're usually pretty vocal at that time as well. Um, and then they'll uh, start to break off in little subgroups and you'll watch, um, you know, there'll be a group of about 20 or 25 that take off and head off in one direction and then another sub flock that head off in another and those tend to be family groups and closer groups that are connected. So they don't stay as a group all day, they fly off and start foraging in their favorite spots that they've decided they like. And those change throughout the year as different things are in season. So that's, uh, that's what they look like in the city. Um, generally, they do pretty well, but um, as I mentioned, there are a few uh, scenarios where they can find themselves in need of a hand. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the individuals that we've rescued. Mikabu's taken in over 150 of the wild parrots since we began 
accepting them in about 2003. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of things that happened to them. I thought I'd share a few stories about some of them, um, including many that are still with us, either as foster birds or adopted today. So let's start with um, a few who fell foul of um, broken bones. Broken bones are one of the um, less pleasant, well, I mean, none of it's pleasant, but um, we don't see we don't see a lot of leg fractures, but occasionally we do. Um, so Julian had a hip fracture. Uh, Julian's still a foster bird with Nikabu, even though they came in, gosh, I think it's something in the region of about eight to 10 years ago. So Julian's a long time foster with Nikabu um, and had a hip fracture, which was put in plaster and uh, spent a couple of uncomfortable weeks chewing off their first cast and had to get another one put on. So um, plenty of energy and very feisty despite having had a broken hip. Um, but the second one worked and uh, Julian is doing great now and is um, paired up with Mushi and fostered by one of our amazing um, well parrot volunteers. So Julian recovered from this injury, um, not enough to survive in the wild. Um, he needs uh, rope perches to, to perch on because they're a little easier to grip on, but has otherwise uh, recovered quite nicely and is living a very comfortable life um, with plenty of human servants and uh, also mushy for bird company and is doing great. Uh, we've got another photograph of another bird who came in with a leg injury. This is Zelly. Uh, Zelly had not a broken bone, um, but a, a sprain which was pretty painful. And so um, we splinted that for a while as well. Unfortunately, Zelly had some other health issues and, and didn't survive, but um, we do our best in all cases and get them the medical care that they need. Um, some of the birds fall foul of predator attacks. And we have a picture of Mushi here uh, who became Julian's friend. Uh, this is before Mushi was rescued, uh, actually taken by the person that rescued Mushi um, and named her. So um, Mushi was flying around and was uh, attacked by a hawk who put a hole right through her beak, um, which would have been really painful because beaks are vascular and sensitive um, and essential for the bird's survival. So when uh, she showed up at someone's um, backyard feeder like this, they were able to get a hold of her. Um, she was also a little wobbly too. I, don't, um, I think the hawk might have had to go at her because she was already not feeling well and a little slower than the rest. Um, but she managed to get away and um, was rescued and uh, her beak has healed up amazingly. It's never going to be perfect. Um, it does need the odd trim and it has a bit of a groove in it, but it's um, looking very different now. So Mushi is uh, also living a life of luxury um, with Julian and, and doing just fine. So um, they've, they've survived their ordeals. So some, sometimes we see fractures, sometimes we see predator attacks, um, but one of the more common things that we see are birds like these two, Hattie and Bowley, um, who come in uh, tipping over and sort of walking in circles and unable to stand up straight um, and just generally looking what, what we call ataxic, where they're essentially just very wobbly, um, tipping over and tumbly. Um, sometimes they'll tip over onto their backs and have to right themselves and then their um, heads will tilt and they'll sort of be looking with one eye up, one eye down, and they never really seem to stand straight. Um, sometimes they can't grip with their feet. Um, sometimes they have uh, issues where if they try to fly, they'll sort of fly in a circle, sort of helicoptering rather than um, flying in a straight line. And these are all signs of neurological damage. And for a long time, there was a theory that uh, this was related to um, a worm which was being passed in raccoon feces that the birds were somehow ingesting. Um, but in all the years that we've been taking these birds in, every time that one passes away, we always do at least a gross necropsy and that would see evidence of that, very clear physical evidence. If that was happening and causing neurological damage, you would be able to see that physically in their brains. And never in a single necropsy have we seen any evidence of that. Um, so we began funding research to try and get to the bottom of this. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, that resulted in a paper being published. So that paper is um, out on plus one um, and this was the culmination of essentially four years of work um, where um, collaborating with the avian vets who help us treat a lot of the, the birds that we take in from the wild flock and also um, uh, UGA Lab of Infectious Diseases um, and uh, a couple of the um, 
couple of the uh, researchers there um, and some other paper authors, um, they essentially had to um, come up with a new test to detect bromethylene in the samples that we were sending them. So um, they used high performance liquid chromatography um, and came up with a test uh, in that method to detect bromethylene in the remains that we were sending them from birds from the wild flock that had passed away. And this was a, a, a whole process where we had to tighten up our protocols around when the birds are taken in. Um, we needed to collect the feces from new sick birds um, immediately um, and freeze the samples and collect enough of it so that they would have enough material to work with. Um, obviously, you know, when the birds come in, when they're found, they're often taken to the shelter in San Francisco and then we're notified and then we try to uh, we tried to pick them up as quickly as possible, but then the shelter staff were sort of throwing away whatever was in the um, housing that they were kept in in the meantime. And so we had to work very closely with the shelter and with our volunteers to pick them up as quickly as possible, freeze any droppings, um, and collect as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, if the birds did pass away, um, sending the whole body off to the lab at Georgia to um, give them the, the best possible chance of finding any traces of anything. Um, bromethylene has a very short half-life. It's not easy to test for in the best of times. And the birds are so small compared to cats and dogs and other animals where bromethylene has been tested. There wasn't really a test that was effective. So this research culminated in proving that yes, the birds were ingesting bromethylene, which is um, a neurotoxin that's in the latest generation of rat poisons. So uh, rodenticide is the problem. And we need people in San Francisco to use rodenticide responsibly or ideally not at all. Um, there are lots of alternatives and we could talk about that in another presentation. Um, but the message right now is um, to keep it away from wildlife because um, I'm sure if it's affecting the wild flock, it's affecting other wildlife as well. So um, now that we know this and we have research to prove it, um, we have a follow-up paper that came out as well, and we're still seeing, even this year, we've taken in several birds that had clear signs of bromethylene ingestion, so um, it's an ongoing problem. We've, we've talked to the city, they don't use it in anywhere except the sewers, so um, it's not something the city are doing, um, but it's readily available to purchase in pellet form um, online, so, you know, if people don't use it in appropriate containers and just scatter it. It could easily be being used on, you know, apartment buildings and other places where the flock land. So um, this was this was a significant uh, effort for us. I'm really proud of getting this paper out. Now we just need to get the word out <laughs> and try and um, try and make sure that people understand the impact that this has on wildlife if they're not responsible. Um, so let's talk about some of our wobbly bromethylene birds. Um, when we take in birds that show signs of bromethylene poisoning, um, we really just have to see how it goes. Um, there are a couple of treatments, but mainly it's supportive care. Um, the biggest problem is the swelling in the brain caused by the um, neurological uh, problems and edema. So mannitol is one drug that we're trying um, to try and help reduce inflammation in the brain. Um, but really it's supportive care and gavaging and um, uh, appropriate safe um, environment for them. And then just seeing how they recover and giving their brain a chance to heal. Um, so usually around the three months mark, we'll find that um, they'll either begin to decline, in which case we have to monitor um, what is happening there. And that may result in euthanasia or they may just have a seizure and pass away and we lose about half of the birds that we take in with bromethylene poisoning in that scenario. The other half um, tend to stabilize and depending on what kind of damage was inflicted um, to their motor skills they may be able to perch, they may be able to climb, they may be even uh, might be able to fly a little bit. Um, and so we see quite a scale where some of the birds are super wobbly as I like to say very technical um, or in some cases, actually pretty mobile. So we're gonna show you a little sample of a bit of everything. And I'm starting with Beale and Clay. Um, Beale and Clay are a pair of birds that I'm fostering. Uh, they both had the same sad story that they paired up with another of the wild parrots when they first arrived with us only for their friend to pass away. Um, and we do try to pair them up because we find that as a pair, 
they can still be quite sociable with people. You know, Bill and Clay will both come and take treats out of my hand. Um, but they really, really love having another bird. I mean, you can see these two are just super tight. Look at them. You know, they're always together. Um, and they preen each other a lot. Um, and they they do everything together. Uh, you know, they'll bathe at the same time. They'll hang from the top of their cage together. They'll chew on the same toy. They sleep together. They're just two peas in a pod. So um, it's very good that um, they were able to find each other after losing their first partners when they came in from the wild. And um, their favorite habits are um, bathing, eating, chewing toys, and sleeping. <laughs> um, and they think they're very clever. So this is Beale and Clay um, being very clever and hiding from me. Um, we line the bottom of their environment with towels and flannels because they are at the very tumbly end of the scale. So Clay in particular, um, he will try to run away quickly when he thinks I'm doing something in their cage, like changing the towel. Um, and he sort of does a sort of, it's almost comical. He'll sort of run two or three steps and then he'll do like a full forward roll and then just get up on his feet and keep going. Uh, he has a tendency to tip over a lot, but he can perch and climb and he loves hanging from the top of the cage by his feet. So um, giving them soft towels means that they're able to uh, fall safely and not a great distance. They're in a raised base cage, so they won't fall very far. And so he, will, he won't hurt himself when that happens. Um, and then they do just fine. It does mean you have to do bird laundry, which is my least favorite thing, uh, but it's completely worth it. And we have a little routine down for that, um, which makes it doable. So um, lots and lots of bird flannels and towels in this household to keep everyone safe and comfortable. Um, I have a little video. This is a little video of Beale. Let's see if I can get it to play. Here we go. So this is uh, Beale actually out of his cage, which is not allowed, but he was being a rebel. We were setting up for their feature in one of our adoption fairs. So we had to get him back in his cage because the adoption fair was about to start. <laughs> and he was very cooperative because he wanted to be back with Clay, but he liked to have a little nosy just to see what was going on on top of his cage. So you can see that that's their housing. The horizontal bars are great for them to climb on easily. Um, and they use rope perches everywhere because that's what they find comfortable to grip on. Um, but they do like their little shelf perches on the front as well. And they'll often, well, they, like, they also enjoy chewing them up. So um, they go through a lot of chew toys because they're quite chewy birds, like most Conyers. So that's Bill and Clay. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we have another pair to introduce you to who are happily adopted, and their names are Sansom and Dewey. Sansom and Dewey are two of the most charming and perfect wild conures that we've seen um, getting adopted, and they have really thrived in their adopted home. Um, we have a, a small number of people who are fostering um, most of the, uh, the wild parrots that we've taken in and rehabilitated, and um, as a result, they don't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, but Sansom and Dewey are excellent proof that um, these formerly wild parrots can thrive in the right care. We have, it's quite comical actually, we get a lot of the vets warning us when we bring them a wild parrot saying, oh, this is a wild parrot, you know, you're probably going to have a lot of issues here because they're going to panic in, in captivity. Um, and then we show them pairs like Sansom and Dewey who have just gone from strength to strength. And this is Sansom and Dewey hanging out on their favorite play stand in their adopted home. Um, they came in separately. Um, found each other once they were part of Mikabu. Um, and uh, I fostered them for a while. They were paired up at my house and uh, uh, Sansom needs a regular beak trims. He has a slight scissor beak. And um, that's about once every two months or so. He needs to go and get his beak trimmed. Um, and Dewey was rescued as a baby after a nest attack and was the sole survivor. So um, Dewey actually talks a little bit. He says hello and a couple of other things. Um, and they have become recall trained. So Megan Cadell adopted them. Megan's one of our amazing Mickey volunteers. Um, they could fly a little bit, um, but they weren't getting a lot of out time in their foster home. Uh, Megan began working with them and recall trained them to fly to her shoulder. And I'm gonna play a little video just to show what that looks like. So here's Megan. And this is what she can do with her wild parrots. Ta-da! They are, um, that was not a fluke. And just to prove it, I have another video of the same thing happening. 
look at that. Um, so yeah, they are super sweet um, and very social. And whilst they enjoy being a pair and having each other, they really enjoy hanging out with Megan too. So um, it's just great proof that they can have um, a really enriched and um, a pretty good quality of life, even in our homes with the right care and with the right preparation. So um, I'm super proud of both Megan and Sansom and Dewey because they're rock star ambassadors for what we're able to do when things work out and we are able to help with the rescue. All right, let's move on and talk about Joey. Joey is a solo bird. He doesn't seem too into other birds, but he started out life in the wild flock. Um, as you can see, this is a picture taken in San Francisco before he came in. So he was living um, out on the streets as a filthy street urchin parrot. Um, it always, I kind of forget just how filthy the birds are um, living out there. It's, you know, it's a, it's a rough life out in the city. Uh, you've got to eat what you can and uh, you know, there's a lot of drought. I'm sure they find water water sources that they figured out in the city, but they don't bathe um, quite as thoroughly as our birds do with us. So they're kind of dirty and stinky when they come in. Uh, Joey's a good example of that in his wild form here. Um, he's a pretty filthy bird. Um, he befriended someone who was living on the Filbert Steps. So a lovely lady named Kathleen um, had moved into an apartment on the Filbert Steps and realized that the wild parrots were flying by. So she started putting out food for them, as a lot of people do. And uh, she was pretty generous. She started putting out slices of Granny Smith apple. So, you know, not just sunflower seeds, but, you know, fresh fruit. So that was pretty popular. Um, and Joey particularly loved this Granny Smith fresh apple. So um, it got to the point where he would just kind of hang around waiting for fresh apple. And Kathleen found herself having to come out um and uh offer him extra slices and uh Kathleen and Joey essentially fell in love and uh Kathleen has photograph after photograph of hanging out with Joey um whilst he was a member of the wild flock just hanging out eating apple chilling out getting to know each other um and this went on for a long time <laughs> so he was pretty happy However, uh, eventually at one point, uh, Kathleen noticed that Joey is starting to look a little wobbly and a little slow. So um, this little video here, this is Joey on the balcony outside Kathleen's apartment. And as you can see, uh, he's on his own. Um, and that's not a good sign because the flock fly around together and they need each other for protection. Um, he was really wobbly and slow and he wasn't keeping up. The other birds were flying off and ignoring him and uh, he was having some issues using his feet and he wasn't flying particularly straight and you can see there's a batch of uh, fresh pin feathers on his neck there which suggests that um, someone had been tugging at his feathers and pulling out a few so he was not doing well and so Kathleen started searching for how do I help a sick parrot and she found Mickaboo and started talking to us and said well what am I going to do um, I've never you know handle the parrot uh what do you do when they're sick and we started giving her advice and saying well you have to see if you can get them in a box and get them to us we got them checked out of the vet so um she took a big breath and uh grabbed him in a box and took him to mickaboo and we took him to the vet and we got him checked out and he seems like a mild bromethylin case he's um, a little tippy but he does perch so he's in a soft liner here but he's got a perch and he, he perches quite well he's got a uh, a boing we call them it's a spiral rope perch that hangs from the top of the cage and joey loves sleeping and climbing up his boing so as long as it's grippy and rope that's a lot easier for him um and so uh he wouldn't make it he he's not able to keep up with the wild flock anymore but um he lived with kathleen for a year she fostered him once he got out of the vet and uh we set him up in a little environment that was safe for him, but gave him toys to explore and some perches he could climb up. Um, and she showered him with fresh food. <laughs> Joey is a very good eater. He loves his veggies. Uh, he loves carrot and spinach in particular. This is Joey with a face full of carrot and some cauliflower. Um, we got all the updates and pictures from her. And uh, this is him chewing on some spinach and really getting into it. Joey's beak has been many colors over time. Um, and he's also pretty friendly. Um, he will accept head scratches and really lean into them. He's uh, one of the few wild parrots we have that is a sucker for a good head scratch. 
he'll just kind of keep that up for as long as you have time to sit with him and do that. He doesn't really like to be on your hand particularly, but he will always come out for a head scratch. So he's become a real love and he seems to prefer that over other birds. So um, he's still living with me. I'm still fostering him. Kathleen couldn't keep him um, after a year. Um, they have other pets and they have young family as well. So um, that didn't work out for the long run, but he's a really sweet bird. And if anyone's interested in fostering Joey, we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, all right, let's talk about another couple of pairs. April and Lion are um, a sort of uh, combination pair where April is actually a very good flyer. She's one of the fastest um, best flyers in my house. Um, but all of her toes point forwards and she has a scalped head. She was attacked by a hawk. Um, so she uh, she's actually quite mobile, but she has some issues with perching normally. Um, but when she gets out and goes for a fly, she can make it upstairs. She's flown the length of my house several times and uh, it's hard to keep up with her. And then Lion is uh, definitely a bromethalin case um, and has the classic wobble and tip and fall over issues that we've seen with um, Beal and Clay and the other birds that we were showing you. But they love each other very much. This is uh, April. This is actually a picture of two birds. Uh, April is lying down. <laughs> they spent a lot of time preening. Um, and April, because she can't perch normally with her feet, um, she'll preen her uh, belly by lying on her back and then just kind of tipping herself over. So they do a lot of this, but they don't like me taking pictures of it. So I had to sneak this one from the other side of the cage. Uh, and then I also wanted to show Spencer. So we're getting towards the end of the bird showcase here. But um, Spencer is adopted by one of our amazing Telegraph Hill team uh, volunteers, Chloe. Um, Spencer has some heart issues, so he was plucking. So he wears a, a collar um, and he's on heart medication, which have helped a lot, but the collar also helps. So most of the time he wears a collar, um, but he can fly even with the collar on and he loves hanging out in Chloe's aviary. This is him hanging out on the arm of her chair right there. Um, and uh, Spencer's quite a character. Um, Chloe also has a blue crown conier called Polly, and um, they enjoy having dates on the hanging planters in uh, Chloe's aviary. So I thought this was a particularly sweet picture because this is Polly and Spencer on a date hanging out on uh, one of Chloe's planters. Um, I wanted to show some pictures. There was a pretty unique situation many years ago, back in 2009, where we had an entire nest of um, baby conures that fell from a tree and the nest was unsalvageable um, and so when the birds came into animal control Mikabu was asked if we could take care of them and one of our amazing former volunteers who's no longer with us by the name of Malraf agreed to take them in um, and they arrived literally as babies out of the nest so um, the birds don't fledge every year until around late September mid to late September um, so we start seeing uh, the fledglings. We usually get about three or four babies a year when they have issues with um, a bad fledging experience. But these were July 30th. So they had, they had barely hatched. Uh, as you can see, they've got almost no feathers. And, um, and so they needed regular feedings um, very, very frequently. Um, Spencer's adopted. Uh, we just got a comment that Spencer's not on our website, but uh, Spen Spencer's adopted, which is why he's not showing up on Mikabee's website. He's not a foster. Yeah, so these babies came in and um, they, they had to be fed every few hours. Um, it was a lot of work and a lot of dedication, but they grow super fast. And it's kind of a unique opportunity to see how the wild conures quickly grow in um, their feathers. This is just a few days later on August 4th, and they've already got significantly more pin feathers and down. Uh, and interestingly, you can also see two of them have red on their um, on their heads. So their, their red mask grew in immediately. And a lot of the hybrids, that's kind of a mitered uh, pattern. Um, the hybrids tend to have red even as baby. And a lot of people get caught out by this. We've had some of the vet techs actually tell us that this can't be a baby parrot. It's got red already on its head. And we've had to show them these photographs and point out that the hybrids do uh, molten um, even as babies with red on their heads so um, it's not a given that all the babies are completely green which I thought was kind of an interesting thing to share and by another eight days they are already showing way more feather and getting pretty big although you can still see they've got the classic baby beak with the little bulges on the side I think it's you know one of the things that people find adorable about them with their great big eyes 
And then just another six days after that, they almost look adult sized and they have their feathers uh, still, you know, still a lot of pins there, but um, there's uh, easily enough feathers for them to start flapping around and getting very flappy. Um, and within another week, um, they would have been practice flapping and very, very active and moving around in the nest and considering when they wanted to make their way out. Um, and so, you know, Mal was amazing about um, teaching them about pellets early on and giving them fresh food and giving them a good enriching environment, you know, even as babies. So um, they built a dedicated aviary for them and decided to keep them. So uh, a few months later, this is what they looked like as um, year one adults, kindergarten class, uh, fully graduated and, uh, and, um, and they decided to stay together in that aviary. So that, that's our, our babies from 2009. And as I mentioned, we get babies every year. This is Alamo who came in last year. Um, sometimes they just have a rough time of it and people find them on the ground, uh, you know, not flying and looking pretty poorly. And sometimes it's just, you know, nutrition, dehydration or an injury when they fledge and whack into something and hurt themselves. And then they've got a sprained wing or something like that. Um, and in fact, one of those cases is Tingley here who came in this year. Tingley is one of our babies from 2022. Um, he came in with um, a report that they'd seen some crows attacking him in the nest and they'd extracted him by his toes. Um, so we weigh them when they come in. 174 grams is actually a really good weight for a baby bird. Um, we could see he had an injured foot and we weren't sure about the rest of the leg. So we got him off to the vet and um, turned out that he had a toe injury um, and a big sprain in his ankle. And when you sprain your ankle, you know, and if you're a human, then we put you in a boot. So if you're a bird, we put you in a surfboard, <laughs> which is the, really the only easy way to stabilize the ankle. Uh, you basically just tape both feet to um, some popsicle sticks and use a bit of tape there. And uh, for about three or four days, just keep the ankle completely stable that way, um, which is not much fun for Changli, but looks incredibly cute. Um, and the one advantage of being stuck in a surfboard when you're a baby bird is that you get room service 24 seven. So um, we've got some video of Tingley uh, demanding his room service. This is him just trying to figure out what he's supposed to do when he can't use his feet. <laughs> he just has to look around and ask for what he wants. Um, but he handled it pretty well. He was a very good patient and uh, a very patient patient. And um, we, uh, fortunately found that he quickly adapted to and understood that syringes contain yummy, yummy food. So he took his formula like a champ and um, was really well behaved. After a few days, he was able to get out of his surfboard boot and start physio. This is Tingley's physio, gripping onto that finger and using his foot. And uh, after doing a few workouts like that, we um, were able to set him up in a, in a cage with a rope perch and buddy him up with another wild parrot so that he had a bit of company and learned how to be a bird a little bit. Um, so we had another wobbly wild conure in there with him, which he really appreciated. Well, they both did. And uh, he's doing great. So the good news is his foot's looking pretty good and we're still evaluating him to see how he's gonna, how he's gonna work out in terms of 100% mobility. So I hope you found this uh, an interesting um, insight into the different kinds of issues that the wild parrots run into and how Megaboo helps them. Um, just a few things to leave you with before we wrap up the, uh, the presentation and we'll, we'll happily take some questions. Um, please consider helping. Um, we'd love to add a few people to the wild parrot team. Um, since I became the acting CEO, I have to confess, it's been hard to focus as much on the wild parrots as I would like to. And we would love to do more outreach to help people in the city understand the dangers of remethylene and how it's affecting the wildlife. So um, helping us with that would be fantastic. Um, you can also become a foster home. We have several uh, parrots that are potentially foster candidates. Um, we have quite a few that we are boarding um, under what we call medical boarding um, at the vets, but as you've seen, you know, the birds have different levels of mobility and for those that are more active and perching better um, with good communication and lots of preparation, we'd love to mentor some fosters 
it's a little different than fostering a regular conure um, from Ikabu, but um, if you're happy to keep in touch with us a lot and weigh the bird regularly um, and take a lot of advice on environment setup, um, it's a little bit more high maintenance and it can involve doing bird laundry with all those towels, but it's really, really fun. And, um, and I, I may be biased, but I think that all of our Telegraph Hill foster people are extremely awesome and uh, we make a good team. So if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have some more foster homes. Um, and, uh, oh yes, quick shout out. We're <laughs> speaking of wild parrots, um, you might've heard of the film and we are working on re-releasing it in 4K so that you can watch it on all the popular streaming services that are out there. Um, I've been involved in that project too. It's a little slightly different than my normal parrot work, but it's fun parrot work nonetheless and working with Judy has been a thrill. Um, so that's coming very, very soon to uh, hopefully your uh, high definition screen in your front room. And uh, I included some resources in here because this, again, was a very public presentation that we did at the Academy of Science. So um, we recommended some other um, rescues that do wild parrot work, SoCal Parrot Group. Um, they only rehabilitate and release wild parrots. So they take in a lot of Amazons, a lot of conures that they have down in Southern California, and they have huge aviaries where they do that. Um, Brooke, who runs that rescue, has a great presentation that was part of the Lefebvre series. So that's on YouTube. Um, and there's a lot of other resources in here just related to training and education. So it's kind of a starter for 10 for people who are new to the world of parrots and wild ones. Um, do you consider fostering? I added a little slide for today because I really wanted to showcase. Um, I've made some of my closest friends through doing this and the Welcome Your team really are a good bunch. Um, and we really do need in the next year to focus on placing more of these birds in new foster homes. We, we got a great new wild parrot foster home this year, but that was one foster home. Um, and we've got way more than that that we need to place. So uh, do consider joining us. It's a lot of fun and the birds really appreciate it. A um, little bit of credit here. Thanks to everyone who volunteers on the wild flock team. It's a little different than the regular species coordination because of all the medical stuff and all the constant picking up sick birds from shelters. Um, but it's really fun and um, sometimes the birds get to go home and that's an amazing experience which I always love to bring new volunteers to as well so um, big thank you there and if there are any questions we definitely have time for that uh, I'd be very happy to answer them I could talk about the lot parrots for hours but I should probably stop there and see what questions you have And have we enabled sound for everybody? Maybe it's a good time to do that. Oh, yeah, we could do that. Um, we have the Q&A in the chat. Um, let me take a look at, actually. And oh, Chloe oh. wants to know, who is Tingly paired with now? Oh, uh, Tingly right now is at Dr. Tino's. Um, he was paired with Merlin. Unfortunately, Merlin has passed away. He had a a seizure and then declined a lot after that. So we've lost Merlin, um, but she has one more foster over there. So uh, I forget his name. Um, so he's not alone. Does Tingley still need medical attention? I see that his uh, medical status on the website says injured, recovering. Yeah, it's unclear what the long-term prognosis is gonna be. Um, he's still only a few months old. So um, whether or not we, consider him a release candidate is TBD. Um, we okay. um, and also mentioned in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat that we actually have, <clears throat> excuse me, a hardcover book on the Wild Pairs of Telegraph Hill that's going to be a little bit special because we're going to be asking Mark Bittner to uh, sign it and dedicate it for to someone. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and what makes that particular auction item special? Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to screen share it. Um, there are no more hardcover books available from Mark's book. I mean, if it was published a few years ago now, um, it's only out there in paperback. Um, but there, he has a small number of hardcovers left, so he's generously agreed to donate one to us. Um, and once we have a winner from the auction, he will happily sign it and dedicate it to you. Um, you can request whatever name you'd like to have in there and he'll sign the front for you. Yeah. And, uh, and right now it is at $71 for that particular item. We have a question. 
can you ever release rehabilitated wild parrots? I imagine it depends, of course, on their health status. Yes. Um, yes, yes, we can. And yes, we do. Um, for several years now, um, we have been evaluating the birds for release. We try not to release one on their own. Um, we like to have at least two. Um, and we have a couple of aviary situations that we have access to and the birds will rehabilitate and fly in aviaries um, for at least two weeks and ideally a bit longer. That gives them a chance to reacclimatize to being outside and get their pectoral muscles back up to speed and make sure that they've got the stamina to keep up with the flock when they go back home. Um, we tend to do dawn releases at sunrise um, and uh, take them back to the main flock. So um, we've done releases in different ways um, from private locations where the birds come in significant numbers and also at the roost. Um, and uh, it's not big numbers, um, maybe three or four a year. Um, so there's maybe only a couple of events. Um, I think we've done one this year, but um, Okay. We have another question about the THCs that are with us in our homes, and we know that toys are a great enrichment activity. What are the best toys for a THC in our home? Oh, um, usually natural material toys. So anything that's made from um, palm material or mahogany pods. Um, Wood is very popular. Leather is very popular. Um, they do also really, oh yeah, yuccas, the yucca chews, Megan's mentoring. Um, they also do really enjoy bells. So um, I think hanging at least one tubular bell in there that they can um, use to scratch their head as well as uh, enjoy making a noise on and climbing on is a good idea. Um, but yeah, they're big chewers. So um, most of the Planet Pleasures toys, um, you know, they have like bamboo and other natural woods in them, those are big hits, um, but they go through them pretty fast. So uh, you can stock up in the auction and get as many as you can. <laughs> but the great thing with the well parrots is that they are naturally very good fresh food eaters because they're very used to it. So um, I have a great appetite for the fresh chop, um, but it does also mean that you need to serve it fresh because if you try and offer them defrosted vegetables, they will turn their beak out at them. They're not used to defrosted frozen veggies and they don't want them. So uh, they have high standards, but they really enjoy fresh food, which is really nice because a lot of people obviously you know, spend a lot of time like convincing their parrot to please eat just one carrot. Um, whereas the wild parrots just tear into everything immediately. They're pretty good about fresh food. Yep, and Chloe makes a good point. Of course, Chloe in the audience is also a member of the Wild Flock team at Mikadu and notes that uh, some of them like action toys, strings with lots of beads that they push up and watch fall. Yeah, I'm pushing stuff around. Um, I have enabled talking, so if anyone wants to just unmute and ask a question verbally, that's, that's also an option. Um, we've done that. And shall I just promote everyone to a panelist so people can turn their cameras on because we're coming up to the happy hour time. Should we do that now? Go for it. Yes. And I will note there that the auction ends in six minutes. So <gasps> if you have bids out there that you might want to double check on, okay. make sure you're winning whatever uh, you were planning on gifting to yourself, your family, your friends. Uh, now is a great time to do that. <laughs> and I think, Sarah, you've got a few things too <laughs> that you might have. Um, we, I will also note that we, uh, many of us are fans of the tie-dye items that Megan Cowdell has very generously created and donated to the auction. There are three tea towels that are hand dyed that were just added, I want to say maybe an hour or two ago. They are featured items on the front page. Nobody has bid on them yet. So that's a fabulous opportunity there for you to get the very popular hand dyed uh, tea towels there. And we are currently at eh, 44,800 in terms of our fundraising. Thank you very much, everybody, on our road, on our way toward hitting the 50,000 mark by the end of today. And as a reminder, we have a matching event underway where dollars donated either through the auction site or at our normal donation 
links are eligible for the uh, 33% match by our anonymous generous donor. Okay, we've got now five minutes before the auction ends and we are still taking questions for Sarah. If anybody would like to pose such about the Telegraph Hill Conyers, cute as they are. Do we have a Conyer who would like to make a personal appearance, perhaps? Uh, we, we don't. Well, I mean, there, there are two Conyers currently loose in this room. However, they're not wild Conyers. And so bringing one up here would get problematic because there's already two on the loose. Um, Marty and Wendy are um, out in order to stop them from screaming because... Uh, well, do they want to make an appearance? I mean, they Earth don't like being contained. We might be able to make an appearance. Hang on, let me turn... Let me turn off my virtual background. I'll uh, I'll take off the fancy background. We might we oh, might yeah. get Wendy. Wendy's aha. When Wendy, we've discovered thanks to Megan's bird whispering efforts that today. Wendy will step up on a rope perch. <laughs> Good job, Wendy. Thank you. She she's also not very afraid of fingers, so you can kind of go. Boop. <laughs> okay, so she yelled and at you. Uh, remind us what kind of a conure is Wendy. Wendy is a dusky conure. Um, dusky. A typical mm. dusky conure with the shrill voice to go with it. So, um, yeah, but as I recall, when I fostered a dusky, um, definitely not the same volume as a sun, for instance, um, and okay. tends to squeak. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, mornings, afternoons, when a boot, maybe. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Yeah, definitely not a wild bird. Um, and Marty is uh, a hybrid. He's a little bit more shy. So um, he he's bonded to her tightly and they pre each other all the time and they, they sleep on a little swing together. Um, so they have to stay as a pair. But Marty has a scissor beak and needs regular beak trim. Beep, beep, beep. So yeah, sorry, no wild parrots because these two are in here. They live in here because there's literally nowhere else in my house where I have room for them. Um, so if you'd like to foster Marty and Wendy, um, they're... <laughs> We need to find a foster home for them. I took them because their uh, original foster was getting noise complaints and he just couldn't uh, continue to foster them. So it was a bit of an emergency to get them out of there because he's a good foster home and we didn't want him to have issues fostering more birds in future. So uh, the really shouty ones came here and now you're messing up my presentation. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah, that's right. She's very loud. <laughs> 